Book 4, Falcon in the Barn, Chapter 22. You aren't people, you're vultures. It was the first day of harvest, 336, when Perrin sat on the platform again. It had been nearly five moons since he was there for the memorial service, when it seemed the entire world chanted General Shin. But tonight there was a different feel in the amphitheater, much like the times he'd caught a thieving boy, forced him into a chair, and set into yelling at him about his duty and responsibility to the world. It never worked. The boys would glare up at him with hardened eyes. Perrin had always been amazed that so few parents were upset with their children's thieving, but now he understood why as he stared at Edge. The majority of Edge stared back at him, suspecting that he was about to ruin their fun and profit. It didn't help matters much that Wibble was completely massacring the carefully worded speech Perrin had prepared for him. How in the world did Wibble become magistrate anyway? In the most accommodating way possible, Wibble was trying to suggest to Edgers that perhaps the resident should consider the feelings of the relatives that may still be around, and that maybe messages could be sent to all parts of the world looking for relatives, and then, if no one responded, then perhaps auctions could be held, and maybe even some of the properties donated to less fortunate families, or to some of the refugees from Orland who still didn't have places of their own. That's when the crowd grew ugly. Perrin could feel the tension growing in the amphitheater and wished he'd had more than 50 soldiers stationed for security. Many of the audience rose to their feet, shouting, Wibble, are you telling us we don't deserve what we get? Why should I give up something I worked for? Moreland survivors? Just how much longer are we supposed to tolerate them? Let them go somewhere else. This is unfair. Colonel Shin had tried to stay squarely in his seat like an appropriate authority, but his shock at their reaction wouldn't let him. He shifted in his chair, trying not to leap to his feet. His plan was perfectly reasonable. That Wibble presented it so ineptly certainly didn't help the mood of the crowd, which was more ravenous than Perrin anticipated. The magistrate cowered under the weight of all the protests, sent to look of appeal to Colonel Shin, and Perrin was on his feet in an instant. If he worried about another General Shin rally erupting, he didn't need to. While most of the villagers silenced and sat down at the side of the colonel, several men continued to stand, their arms folded in challenge. Perrin waited ten long, agonizing seconds before speaking. Almost a year and a half ago, I saw this village pull together all of their resources to save each other's lives. Each of your homes, barns, and shops were damaged. Each of your families faced food shortages, but each one of you made sure no one suffered. We all lost weight last year, but as I look around, I don't see anyone starving today. A few snickers rippled through the crowd as Colonel Shin's eyes paused on rotund Mr. Trum. He was one of the few who continued to stand, his folded arms resting on his great belly. He likely had many plans that Colonel Shin just may see fit to destroy, and he wasn't about to let that happen. Just this morning, I had read a report about how much property had been acquired during the past few nights. I'm sure those things weren't taken by our precious sons, which leads me to believe that someone else is picking up where the boys and the garters have left off. A few people squirmed in their seats, but not as many seemed to feel as guilty as the colonel had hoped. I have also read a report on how many lands, houses, and shops have been snatched from the dead. His voice boomed across the amphitheater. A couple of the standing men sat down. A few still remained, including Trum. Perrin took a few deep breaths to regain his composure. I can't help but wonder why. Our crops will be excellent this year. We'll have more than we expected to store. The herds have rebounded. Trades come back. The shops are rebuilt and people are buying goods. We have no more threat of attack from the garters. 
Thievery is down, or it was, an irritated edge entered to his tone. He shook his head in disappointment. I've lived here for 17 years now, and I predict that this will be one of our most prosperous years, yet that's not good enough for you. A small smile emerged above the multiple chins of Mr. Trum. Colonel, he called out, it is a prosperous year and getting better. Why let others' properties go to waste? I'm not suggesting they go to waste, Trum. I'm suggesting we distribute them more fairly, more equitably, Perrin clarified. Many an edge are struggling to get by. Not everyone's well off. This is an excellent opportunity to balance some of that. I'm suggesting giving the properties, once we have no relatives wanting to claim them, to those in greatest need. Another man stood up. My two daughters just spent their entire weeding season break taking care of our neighbor's farm. Now you're telling me we're not entitled to it after all their labor? Parents squinted at him. Two laborers for three weeks' time? Those wages wouldn't be near enough to purchase any land. I had no idea property values had plummeted so drastically. Nervous chuckles scattered through the amphitheater. But the man wasn't finished. We buried the family, too, and then took their animals as thanks. A woman in another part of the amphitheater, petite yet livid, stood up and pointed at the man. You know full well that hog was supposed to go to us. She had wanted me to have it. The first man pointed at her. The hog? What had you ever done to deserve that hog? He told me how he bought it, raised it, fed it. He was my friend, and his hog belongs to me. You have three hogs already, the woman shrieked. We have only two. The colonel says it's to be fair, and that isn't fair. Before Perrin could explain that wasn't what he'd meant at all, the first man's wife stood up, her face red with rage. You sow, she bellowed at the petite woman. Perrin recoiled. The only sows he knew of were questionable women that hung around the northeast entrance of the fort. Never had he heard the word used that way in mixed company, and certainly not out of the mouth of the cobbler's wife. The hog-wanting woman's husband now joined his wife and pointed at the first man. Put a muzzle on your own sow and give us back our hog like the colonel ordered. Perrin staggered, but no one noticed. It was the makings of a fight, and no edger wanted to miss out on it as the amphitheater erupted in an explosion of noise and shouting. Perrin threw up his hands in disgust, but the only one who saw him was Mari on the front bench, her head slowly shaking in amazement. On either side of her, Jaitsi and Pato stared, stunned. Magistrate Wibble, who'd been wringing his hands, turned to the colonel in desperation. Wibble was all about cooperation, as his campaign speeches declared, and, like all good politicians, he didn't have the first idea of how to establish that. The colonel sighed and did the only thing he knew how to deal with out-of-control people. He drew Ralph's sword. He intended to bang it on the wooden platform to draw everyone's attention and have the smith fix the damage to the tip later. But the movement of his arm and the clanging of the sword as it left the sheath was an ominous sound that everyone noticed it. A terrified hush filled the arena, and everyone sat down, trying to look as small a target as possible. Even Trum shrank on his bench, reducing him to the size of only two men. Perrin was tempted to replace the sword in his sheath, but the effect was too powerful to dismiss. Perhaps it was good that the village, while loyal and grateful, had also been terrified of him. Enough! he roared. The crowd surrounding him inched back even more. What's happened to you? All of you! You just buried your friends and now you're fighting over their possessions? You aren't people, you're vultures. Did they die fast enough for you? Colonel! 
Mr. Trum was on his feet again. A brave act for such a large target. Colonel, he said more calmly, and with a touch of nervousness as the colonel firmed his grip on the sword's hilt. No one's trying to take away the significance of their deaths. We've all lost friends and even some family. But they'd want us to continue, don't you think? They'd want others to have access to all they had. We've suffered greatly this year and a half. We could share stories about it all evening. This is a way of giving some of that back. Giving? Perrin scoffed. Who's doing the giving? No one. You're just taking. The Creator expects more from you. Mr. Trum rolled his eyes and held out his hand dramatically. Colonel, Colonel, with all due respect. Perrin braced for anything. When someone begins with, with all due respect, it means that no respect was about to follow. As much as I appreciate that we have a leader who still thinks about the Creator, how can you be sure this is what he expects? Maybe this is his payment to us for making us suffer. Perrin wished he was closer to Trim. He was sure the man couldn't feel the full fury of his gaze from the middle of the amphitheater. You really think, Trum, that the Creator's going to kill off part of our population so you can have more? You have the largest fields around, the biggest herds, and now I understand you're taking over your neighbor's tannery? Quite a corner on the leather market you'll have, won't you? You haven't suffered at all, Trum, for all the years I've known you. Why do you deserve more? Trum was unmoved. Colonel, Colonel, he said in a sickly sweet tone. Where did nature's laws come from? Perrin wasn't expecting that odd question. He squinted. The creator? And, dear Colonel, the syrupy tone continued, why did only certain families die? I have a theory. Nature's laws. Nature's laws, Perrin repeated dubiously. Nature eliminated those that were not fit or capable for life. Entire families died because nature no longer had room for them. And if the Creator made those laws, then the Creator must have willed them to die so that we can have their goods. We are those who are stronger and fitter for this world, and I'm sorry there are those who have less. But we must consider, Colonel, that nature doesn't prefer them either. Perhaps their poverty is nature's way of eliminating them, too. Perhaps their poverty is the result of others' greed and selfishness, Perrin countered. Trum remained unmoved, the insinuations bouncing off his belly. Bewildered that Trump couldn't see his part in any of this, Perrin continued. With that reasoning, then, you could argue that the land tremor was nature's way of eliminating all of Edge. That's what Nico Mal thought. He was ready to let this village die like Moorland. But if nature wanted all of Edge eliminated, then why are you still here? Because of you, dear Colonel. Trum simpered sarcastically as he spread open his arms. That's what you want to hear, isn't it? Edge is here because of your rescue. Perrin didn't move a muscle, except for a small one near the back of his jaw. No one else dared move either. The crowd shifted their gaze nervously from Shin to Trum to Shin again and to his sword, waiting for a response. But Perrin was too incensed to trust anything that would come out of his mouth at that moment. Trum folded his arms defiantly again. Well, Colonel, not all of us would have perished. Some of us have more ability than others to survive. Perhaps you saved those who nature didn't want saved at all. So nature came back in the form of the pox to claim those who were too weak. Nature always wins. Perrin took a step forward toward the edge of the platform. You have more ability to survive nature's attacks? If nature sent to bear to chase after the two of us, I'll give you one guess which one of us nature would devour, Trum. Trum squirmed. 
The small movement was accentuated through his layers, causing a rippling effect that normally would have been quite humorous. But no one in the amphitheater saw anything amusing about the first debate that platform had seen in over a decade. Nature has its own ways of being selective, Perrin insisted when Trump didn't respond. It doesn't need you to accelerate the process. The Creator allows nature's laws to unfold, but many of those laws are intended for animals to follow, not people. We are to rise above the basic laws and live a higher law. Yes, the world's unfair, nature's unfair, because the Creator is allowing us the opportunity to resolve that as part of our test. We can choose to bring balance. We can choose to fix those inequalities. I'm not here to force anyone. He didn't realize he was gesturing with his sword until Mari told him later. But I am here to ask you to think of the needs of others. I believe the Creator intends for us to use our surplus to help those in need. He's giving us an opportunity to do something good for others, not to take a reward just for surviving. He pivoted to address the entire crowd surrounding him. All of you received other surplus last year. I have the records to prove it. All of you have been beggars waiting in line for the emergency stores from Idemia. Now you have the surplus, so give it to those who need it. Who's to say how much is surplus, Shin? Trum demanded, causing Perrin to spin around to face his section of the amphitheater again. If we have another year like last, I will need all of my resources to make it through. I decide for myself what my family doesn't need. So far, I don't think we have enough. A few brave voices chorused, Hear, hear! Someone else called out, Well, if Trump doesn't think he has enough, I certainly don't either. A louder chorus of, Hear, hear! rippled through the villagers. How much did you need to survive last year? Perrin called out over the din. The people quieted. We lived for weeks off of dried bread, shriveled apples, and bits of meat I chose not to identify. But we survived. And I never want to live like that again, someone shouted. I'm not saying you will, Perrin said. We have far more than that, but some still don't. Already your lives are better, so choose to make others' lives better as well. To a vote, someone near the back began the chant. To a vote! Trum sneered in challenge at the colonel and punched the air above him. To a vote! To a vote! By the fifth cry, the entire amphitheater was demanding a vote. Perrin sighed. It was now beyond his influence. He motioned to the magistrate with his sword. With irritated emphasis, he sheathed his weapon and marched over to a seat to stand by it, his arms folded. Wibble tried to clear his throat over the noise, but the call for a vote echoed even louder. Wibble looked to the colonel, who merely held up his hands and sat down in his chair, shaking his head. Local votes were to be overseen by the magistrates. Only if the voting ran contrary to administrators' decrees could he intervene. But Perrin didn't want to. In fact, he wanted nothing more to do with edgers. He regretted ever wielding his sword in defense of any of them. For 17 years, he sacrificed his life for their safety on too many occasions. Because of these people, he lost sleep, lost time with his wife and children, lost his savings to pay off their expenses, lost his parents, and, for a time, even lost his mind. All for them. Yet when presented with the possibility of an extra hog, or another bushel of corn, or someone's abandoned shop, they couldn't imagine sacrificing anything at all for anyone. They were as bad as Idemia. Perrin hated Idemia. He looked dully over at Mari on the front bench, and she stared back at him, shaking her head in disbelief. He nodded at her once in agreement. His children on either side of her looked around dumbfounded. Finally, the crowd began to silence itself. 
We have a call for a vote, Wibble tried to sound as loud as the colonel. Do we have a spokesman to articulate the nature of the vote? Let Trum speak, someone called. Several voices seconded. Trum waved in acknowledgment and made his way up to the platform with a small grin on his face as others patted him on the back. He was wheezing by the time he reached the top stair and wisely did not look at the colonel. If he had, he most likely would have withered to the size of a regular man under the glare. Trum gestured with his thick hands clubbing the air. I propose we vote on the ownership of the properties left by those who died, he announced. All property currently in possession of others stays in that possession. All other properties not yet claimed will be done so by those living in closest proximity to the deceased. The people cheered in agreement. Perrin leaped from his chair, ran toward the back of the platform, and jumped off, taking the stairs in two large steps. He landed right in front of a very startled Chief Barney and grabbed his arms. Get your men out there now to all the abandoned homes not yet claimed. Why? Barney asked, his eyes hazy as he tried to catch up to the conclusion the colonel had already reached. For a chief of enforcement, he wasn't very swift on his feet and was even slower in his brain. They haven't even voted on anything yet. But they will, Perrin shook his arms to jostle some sense into him. And when they do, what's going to happen next? The chief tried to puzzle it out, but two of his officers nodded as their faces went pale, a bit quicker on the uptake. They heard the call for a vote coming from the magistrate. All in favor? Chief, now to the abandoned properties. Barney nodded obediently and turned to his six men that were behind him, already heading out the back doors. A loud chorus of, Favor! cried out over their heads. Perrin sat down in resignation on the steps of the platform. Any opposed? shouted Wibble. Perrin leaned forward and held his head in his hands. A few timid voices called, Opposed! Then those in favor have... But the magistrate's voice was drowned in the thunder of thousands of edgers in a mad dash to be the first to leave the amphitheater by any exit. A few screams suggested someone had been hurt, but the flurry of people didn't slow. A few even came over the platform and raced down the back stairs past the form of the colonel still hunched on the steps. Perrin began to rock slowly back and forth. Animals, he whispered. Just a bunch of stupid animals. He noticed a blue uniform rush up to him, and he looked up at the owner of it. Sir, Lieutenant Offer panted, what do you want us to do? Head out to the properties as well? Perrin shook his head and stood up. John, I don't want any of my men mixed up in this mess. Tell your soldiers to patrol the roads, protect those who are innocent, especially children and those from Moreland. But do not get involved. We're done sacrificing for this village. Mari gripped the arms of her children, not worried that they joined the stampede, but to make sure they didn't get accidentally swept up in the current. This is madness. At least we already gave my mother's house to that family from Moreland. Pato turned. Wow, I've never seen this place empty so fast. We need to get out of here, said Jaitsey, wringing her hands. I want you two to head straight home, Mari told them, and secure the doors and windows with the iron rods. Why? Jaitsey asked worriedly. Precautionary, Mari assured them, but if someone doesn't get a piece of property they think is owed to them, they just might come seeking revenge on the colonel's house. What about you? Pato said. I'm going up to the fort to watch what's going on from the tower, and then I'll get me an escort home. I'm going to find your father, so you two head home. Jaitsey and Pato nodded and jogged to an exit. Pato! Jaitsey panted as they reached the village green where they could break into a run. Well, as much of a run as Jaitsey's skirt would allow. We're not going home. We're headed to Decketts. Why? 
Did you hear what they were saying about those from Moreland? I heard a bit, Pato said, as he cleared a small bush his sister had to go around. He slowed to let her catch up. Something about them not deserving? Oh, I see. Exactly, stupid skirts, she muttered, as she tried to find a better way to hold them up. Deck doesn't know about any of this, especially that those from Moreland may be targeted. Ah! She cried as her hem caught on a sticky shrub. Pay to warn him. I'll catch up. Are you sure? He called as he jogged backward. We're supposed to stay together. She yanked until her hem ripped. It was another Joriana Kuman Itamia dress, so it didn't matter. Just go! Warn him! By the time she made it to the brighter fort farm, Deckett and Pato were securing the last of Deckett's milk cows in the barn, so Jatesy rounded up the stray chickens. Eventually, all of the animals were locked up, except for the stubborn bull, who was destined for the butcher's and the soldier's table next week anyway. Deckett reluctantly picked up a pitchfork, sighed, and placed himself in front of the latched barn doors. Pato retrieved a hatchet from a woodpile and took his position next to Deckett, while Jatesy gaped at them. You're not seriously going to use those, are you? Of course not, said Pato, insulted. But as I've heard Uncle Shem tell the soldiers before, it's the appearance of things. If you look threatening, danger won't give you a second glance. I hope that's true, Deckett said a bit unsteadily. Jatesy looked around for a makeshift weapon and decided on a fallen tree branch, which she swung experimentally. Deckett's eyes bulged. And what do you intend to do? Help you, she said. I've learned a few things over the years. And she thrust and swiped with the branch. Deckett shuddered and firmed his grip on his pitchfork. No one would really attack all the way up here, would they? I mean, I'm right across from the fort. They'd have to be stupid. Most of Edge is stupid right now, Pato told him. Trust me. Jatesy nodded and was about to add her opinion, but voices coming up the road clamped her mouth shut. Pato's eyes grew large when he heard them, too. Even though the barn was well off the main road, some voices just carry. Pato held out his arm to push Deckett back against the wide barn doors, and he and Jatesy also pressed themselves against the wood, trying to blend in to the faded gray. And Afra, they heard Colonel Shin say, as he strode briskly to the fort. I want four guards over here at the brighter farm. This is, after all, our farm, our cattle, our chickens, our produce, and our farmer in charge of it all. No one's to touch him or anything else. Between Pato and Jatesy, Deckett sagged in relief. Of course, sir, Afra said. I'll get some men down here within the next few minutes. Colonel Shin, flanked by half a dozen soldiers, and now in view of his frozen children, pulled his wife alongside, who struggled gamely to keep up with their rapid pace. And send down two more soldiers as well, Shin said as they hurried up the road to escort my children home and to stay posted at my house. Jatesy's mouth dropped open, and Pato, scoffing loudly, broke formation. Swinging his hatchet in dismay, he called, All right, how did you know we were here? Their father stopped and turned to the three poorly hidden defenders. Mari stared in surprise. What in the world are you doing up here? I told you to go home and bar the windows and the doors. While the other soldiers tried not to chortle, Perrin nodded for them to continue on to the fort, and Afra broke into a jog to get the six soldiers. The shins ducked between the railings of the fence that ran the perimeter of the farm and picked their way through the cucumbers. For starters, none of you would make very good garters, Perrin told them, as he gingerly tried not to step on anything green. You're supposed to blend into your surroundings, Against that gray, the three of you stick out like weeds and dirty snow. Jatesy frowned at her yellow and green dress, while Pato and Deckett nodded feebly at each other's tan shirts. And second, Perrin continued, his voice gentler as he came to the barn. I would have been disappointed if you hadn't come here. Proper help is on the way, Mr. Brighter. 
Thank you, sir, Deckett sighed, loosening his grip on the pitchfork. Perrin tilted his head at it. Good choice of a weapon, though, Deckett. Pato, never use a hatchet. You throw it at someone and miss, then you've just given the enemy a new weapon. Jadesy, you could likely do some damage with that branch, but it looks rather brittle, so one hit is all you'd get before it broke. But Deckett, take a look at this. He stepped back, drew his father's sword, and Mari took a few protective steps out of the way. As Deckett's eyes bulged again, Perrin held the gleaming sword out in front of him, pointed at the young farmer's chest. See how long my reach is? Deckett swallowed and squeaked out a, yes, sir? Jatesy squeezed his arm. I don't think he's trying to run you through tonight. No, I'm not. Now your turn. Perrin beckoned. Hold out the pitchfork. No, don't choke up on it. Slide your hands down a bit more. Now, aim it right here. And he gestured to his belly. Shaking, but trying hard not to as he felt Jatesy watching him, Deckett held out the pitchfork parallel to the ground. The four rusty sharp tines were only inches away from the colonel's stomach. Look at that, Deckett, Perrin said cheerfully which, considering their position, seemed to deck it completely inappropriate. Your reach is longer than mine. Do you realize what that means? No, sir, and I really don't want to. It means you have the advantage, and four sharp points instead of mine just one. Think of the kind of damage you could do puncturing my lungs or gouging my gut. Do I have to, sir? Think about the damage? Perrin chuckled and sheathed his sword again. Deckett promptly put the tines of his pitchfork in the air. Deckett, Perrin said, taking the tool out of his hands, I'm afraid you do. First lesson in defense since the road's still quiet. Jatesy and Mari exchanged a quick smile. Pato squatted, grinning that he wasn't being lectured for once. Now, when you hold out the fork, lead with this hand. Perrin repositioned Deck's unsteady grip and stabilize with this hand. Then you can thrust like this. That's right, son. Now, but Jatesy didn't hear anything else because her mind was repeating what she just heard her father call Deckett. Son. He rarely called anyone son. Not with that tone of voice. She clenched her hands into fists to keep them from shaking in too much joy. All she could think as she watched her father explain why stabbing in the chest likely will get the tine stuck in the victim's ribs, and watch Deckett grow gray at the thought, was, Father called him son. It was only a moment later that six soldiers arrived at the farm, jogging carefully through the plants to reach the barn. Perrin nodded to Deckett that the lesson was over. Maybe you want to help guard the house? Deckett shook his head. No, sir. The structure's not important. They can take whatever if they happen to come up here. The animals are what we'll defend. All that I care about is alive. Jatesy beamed with pride, and when she turned to look at her father, she noticed he was watching her and smiling faintly. He turned back to Deckett. Well said, son. Jatesy was sure her chest would overheat at any moment. Perrin pointed to two sergeants. I want you to escort my daughter and son home, then stay posted at my house. I doubt anything will happen, but remember, we're protecting the innocents. Protect those who don't want any part of this. Mari kissed her children quickly, and Jatesy sent one last look back to Deckett as she started for home. He nodded once to her, adjusted his grip on the pitchfork as Colonel Shin had showed him, and rooted himself before the doors of his barns. A minute later, as they headed again for the fort, Mari squeezed Perrin's arm. You really don't think Deckett could ever use that pitchfork on another human, do you? Of course not, he said. There isn't a drop of soldiering blood in that man. Mari smiled as they entered the compound. You sound a bit pleased by that. He bobbed his head back and forth, which was his usual reaction when he didn't want to articulate his agreement. So I'm guessing, Mari continued, that you went through that little lesson on how farm implements can cause injury or death 
because you were stalling until the soldiers arrived? Once again, you show insight that very few officers possess. None of those three had any hope of holding anyone off. Nor do I think they'll have to, either. But it was nice to see them try, Mari said as they started up the stairs to the tower. Now I'm questioning your insight, because Mari, it's not, he said darkly. Not nice to see them holding weapons at all. You're right, she murmured apologetically. That was a stupid thing to say. And that's the end of the chapter. Thank you.